Hello guys, welcome back to Axangel RC and today we're going to take another look at the MFE Hero Vito plane but this time I will dive a bit deeper and want to show you what is good and what is not so good about this plane according to me and how it has been designed and built. Right off the bat I would like to start with the assembly of the plane. Even fully equipped, props, gimbal and all, the plane can fit back in its original shipping box which is very convenient for transport. MFE do offer a carry case for it but it costs a good deal of cash so I think I will stick to this box for the time being. In the top piece of the styrofoam there are various openings and I suspect they were made with the intention of the user storing stuff there which is exactly what I have done. MK15 radio, batteries, tools, spare props, antennas, telemetry radio, emergency tape, all are stored in there. You remove this and you get access to all of the parts of the plane. In order to remove the fuselage you need to take out the VTO wing sections first, then take out the fuselage. Plug in the VTO wing sections to the fuselage, make sure the locks click good and are not loose. Then take out the end wing pieces and mount those on. Take out the tail pieces and slide them on, making sure the locks are snapped in place and then take out the nose, put that in place and it's done. And it's that easy. And to be completely honest, I like the way this goes together a lot more compared to the Flying Dragon. The wing being in two pieces is not a drawback in my mind as it allows for the VTOL arms to actually be screwed into the wings with brackets and bolts which makes it a lot more secure and removes the weak point by eliminating a second connector for this joint. Case in point, the Flying Dragon's VTOL arms need to be installed and removed for every assembly and disassembly and the locking mechanism is not always well assembled from the factory, hence you get something like this. Pay attention to the right Vito arm here. The moment the motor spun up, it rattled itself off of the plane. Luckily I had speed so I switched back to Fly-by-Wire A and landed it like a normal plane and also I was lucky this happened near me so I didn't lose the Vito arm. This right here is why I like the hero solution much better as there is no chance for the arm to fall out unless you really overlook tightening the bolts that hold the bracket which holds the arm in. I also think that splitting the wing in two sections like they've done makes all the pieces a lot easier and convenient to pack and assemble as experience shows and makes the whole process a lot quicker compared to the flying dragon. I approve. But let's get back on track. Like already mentioned in the previous video on this plane, the Hero comes with two swappable nose pieces which definitely provides a great deal of flexibility when considering how you want to equip it and what you're going to use it for and you don't have to decide at the time of purchase since both nose options do come included with the plane and fit in the box. One is for a gimbal or another hanging payload, the other one I assume would be best suited for mapping where you don't really have a gimbal hanging on the nose but a mapping camera in the middle of the plane pointing down so you don't really need to put anything in the nose but in case you want to with a bit of knife work it will easily house an FPV camera be it for an analog or an HD system that will be up to you. Initially when I opened up the kit before assembly I was a bit hesitant if I should put the gimbal on the nose due to the fact that it is removable and with all things of this nature things usually get loose pretty quick they rattle shake and eventually fall off. However once I glued it all together it turned out that the nose fits pretty snugly in there, there is no movement once you lock it in place and it even has three locks making sure it isn't going to go anywhere. So basically it all comes down to the glue you would use to attach the plastic bits to the foam and how strong it holds. They also provide a set of connectors for the nose so that you can wire whatever it is you have in there through them so you don't fiddle with additional wires every time you have to connect and disconnect it just like on the wings. Remember what Yoda said in the previous video? It is still valid and I made use of them immediately by routing all of the gimbal's cables through there and also the airspeed sensor on the other side. There is not a second set of connectors on the other nose piece but realistically once you solder the cables for something specific it would be highly unlikely you would have other gear on the other nose piece which would be compatible with the same cabling or where it connects to. I suppose you can buy separately a few nose pieces for gimbals so you can quick swap gimbals in which case you would also need to buy a Additional connectors but then since you are swapping gimbals pretty sure the wiring will match up a lot easier and it would be doable which is pretty neat. 
Moving on, like already explained in the previous video, I was not happy with the placement of the airspeed sensor by MFE, so I moved mine to the nose since I'm also using a different pitot tube, not the plastic thingy that MFE provide. They suggested making the mount taller but keeping the location, but that would have prevented the fuselage from fitting back in the box, so I had to consider that as well since I wanted to make full use of the box. The box is important, it greatly reduces shipping and handling damage, and I know Know that from experience. You're the dust too, so use it well. Now moving back along the plane we get to the main plane compartment which in my case houses the batteries in some weird arrangement for balance purposes and since I am not using a mapping camera on this plane the space where it would otherwise occupy is taken up by a battery and the CHM30 air unit and the CFPV hub which allows me to connect two gimbals or cameras to it and then be able to look at both on the radio or switch between the two feeds albeit very clunkily so I don't weigh down the link with two streams. It is not the best solution, but it works. There is good space in the battery compartment and since the plane is recommended to be flown with a Tattoo 22 amp hour 6S LiPo battery, I would assume it fits perfectly in here, but since I separated the forward flight and VTOL systems, I have to use two batteries so things get a bit more cramped and weird, but it is what it is and on this plane that VTOL battery actually has enough juice to allow for at least two take offs and landings before it needs charging provided you keep them short and tidy with no wasteful hovering for no good reason. On the underside is the landing gear and it mounts well enough and will hold as long as you land without sliding the plane, else it will cause damage on its way out. This is one of the things I like better on the Flying Dragon and as the recent accident showed it can be safely landed as a normal plane on its belly while the hero would suffer greatly if this need ever arises as you would damage the gimbal, you would tear out the landing gear and possibly break the vertical tail fin which has whatever antenna you have put in there so I'm actually glad for the hero's Vito arms mounting solution and I pray it lasts a long time and doesn't fail at any point. Of course you have to keep in mind that you can't really design for every eventuality out there so you basically design for one situation or another. It is always a trade-off and this is the route MFE have chosen. You have to do a Vito landing every time unless you want to cause some serious damage. Going further back we get to the flight controller mount. The Hero has provisions for a 3 level installation depending on what gear you will be using and how it will be arranged. You can fit quite a lot here at different levels. It will be tight but it can be done. The CEN7 autopilot is not very tall yet I still decided not to use the top plate but with a lower flight controller you can easily make use of the top plate for more gear. The space under the flight controller mount also provides a good location for additional gear and actually it was designed designed to house the power distribution board for the VTOL and forward flight motors with convenient channels routed to the sides where you can have wires running without having to cut foam or it interfering with anything else. Also I find the wiring channels on the sides of the fuselage very convenient. Always a good idea to help tidy these messes. I have put aluminium tape at the front where the nose wiring goes past the batteries to try and protect it from some interference from the power system. Every little helps. The shelves, if I can call them that, around the autopilot area are also very useful to tuck wires in and get them out of the way or to tuck modules in there as was the case with the CAN splitter board and the telemetry module. Really tidies things up. Above the flight controller is the rear part of the hatch which covers that area and on it there is space to install yet another GPS module. Yes, this plane has quite a lot of spaces provided for GPS modules and antennas which is quite nice because the new Uni RC7 Pro radio works on 2.4 and 5.8 GHz and the air unit comes with four antennas so I will definitely be utilizing pretty much all antenna mounts on this plane when it gets here. In that cover above the flight controller I mounted the HERE 3 GPS unit as it fit absolutely perfectly in the spot there, almost as if it was made for it. I also taped it over with aluminium tape for two reasons. First, since I'm using the compass on that one, I wanted to shield it from the power wiring running below the flight controller and even though it is a good deal away, I thought better safe than sorry. 
Second, in the past with Cube Orange flight controllers, I've had issues when placing the HEAR GPS units right on top of them, so decided not to risk it with the N7. The shielding should prevent any interference going from the GPS to the autopilot or vice versa. Compass calibration went well and in Q-Loiter it seems to be holding its location very well, so I guess the shielding works. I also shielded the CN7 GPS unit which is mounted in the other GPS spot just for the sake of it since it is sitting pretty much on top of the ESC which is not ideal. And speaking of the rear GPS mounting spot, I am not sure which GPS module that was designed around but the placement of the wiring opening means that either you need to have a module which has the cabling coming out of the front or you have to mount it facing backwards unless you want to do another hole at the back of the bed. I decided to mount it backwards so I don't have to cut into the foam and just reverse the compass orientation in the ArduPilot settings during setup to account for the rotation. Under that GPS mounts are two more antenna locations where I have the HM30 antennas coming out of. Don't mind the ugly foam cutting, it was done so I can get a good grip on the antenna base to tighten them down properly. This location is very convenient because you can still fit the fuselage back in the box with very little cutting without having to remove the antennas ever. Just rotate them forward when in the box and rotate them down when in use, which also should ensure pretty much no obstruction with the ground once the plane is in the air. One thing I had to do myself for all these antenna mounts though was to 3D print adapters for them which have a hex inset for the antenna connectors coming from the HM30 or another module which allowed me to properly tighten the nuts on the outside so they don't come loose and the inset would hold the hex in the connector and it won't slip. I think this should have been provided from the factory but it is an easy and quick part to print so I'm happy it works great. Just under that is the ESC location which has been designed so that it allows the ESC plenty of cooling. The original mount was designed for the MFE recommended and branded ESC but since I'm using another one, the Hobby King K470 amp high voltage, I 3D printed another set of mounts and it actually fits great in there. Continuing further back we get to the tail and the vertical fin which houses the telemetry antenna in my case can house whatever you need an antenna for in your case, but I find this solution to use the tailpiece brilliant as it serves both as an additional leg for the plane and gives the best obstruction free position for an antenna on this plane, which will ensure optimal link to the ground. Love it! My only regret is not having a good plastic antenna on the 900MHz band to put in there and give it some more stability. The Dragon Link one is pretty good as an antenna but it does absolutely nothing to add to the leg's strength although it seems to be strong enough even so, so no worries if you don't put anything else there, just make sure those VTOL landings are smooth. Right at the end of the plane we get to the motor mount and it is ok, seems solid enough, assembled well and there are no signs of breaking so far unlike the fighter and its self evacuating nose mount which is just waiting for you to give it some more throttle so it can leave. Keep in mind that a 15 inch prop is the largest you can put on the back so you can fit the plane in the box. So if you want to use a 16 inch or larger it will have to come off every time, hence why I moved to a 15 by 10 prop, makes things even quicker to set up and stresses the motor a lot less compared to the 16 by 12, especially with the new 8S battery which may require that I get a proper T motor ESC either for this motor or together with a new motor since this ESC does not like 8S on the current motor very much, hence why I've limited throttle to 50% now, anything above that and it starts to get the hiccups. That is how I burned out the original motor I used without even being able to test fly it on 8S, as the autopilot gave it throttle for the transition it would stutter right away and eventually I saw the smoke coming out while testing on the ground. The only other possible alternative I had at hand was this T motor which is even higher KV so not the ideal option when also upping the voltage, but it seems to work a lot better with the ESC than the old one. We'll have to figure something out though because gaining altitude with the throttle capped at 50% happens very slowly. And if I am to chase clouds and mountain tops with this plane it will have to be quicker. And now I want to turn your attention to the servos I have used on this plane and also the servo horns I had to 3D print to make them work. 
So it seems if you opt out of buying the MFE servos, chances are whatever else you get will not come with the correct size servo horns to fit the control surface adapters on the wings and tail. Yes, there is a small metal round thing that you install which does the majority of the work, but I felt like I needed to make the servo horns themselves fit perfectly in those openings in order to greatly increase the surface area upon which the servo applies pressure when moving, thus spreading the load over a larger area and hopefully ensuring this will last much longer. Since the Corona servos I got did not have the right servo horns at the correct width, I ended up designing and 3D printing some, which after some convincing on the belt sander fit very well and there is no slack in them. The only movement comes from the servo itself and I have to report that a dozen flights in and perhaps over 8 hours of flying in total have been completely trouble free and the servo horns do not seem to be loosening up, so I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. In conclusion, I do have to say that indeed I am impressed by this plane. It has been a pretty awesome performer so far and I hope that would continue to be the case. Only slight gripe I might have with it is that if the camera bay had been just a tad wider, I would have been able to fit the current mapping camera in there, so would not have needed to buy the Flying Dragon Veto. As it stands, it will only fit a smaller variation of the mapping camera, which sadly has worse optics and I don't have it, so the hero got allocated for personal use. Endurance runs are still pending and I will also do a more thorough video on the MK15 radio system, at least one more video of the HM30 system with the larger antennas and on a tracker and hopefully soon enough an introduction and testing of the Uni RC7 Pro system so stay tuned as there are interesting things to come. If you have liked this video please make sure to like, share, subscribe and notify so you never miss a new one. A big thank you to all my Patreon supporters and everyone who has supported this channel in any way. Fly safe and I will see you in the next one.